Hey guys, when Google announced that they had achieved quantum supremacy in October of last year, it was all over the media. The BBC was writing about it, the New York Times was writing about it, even Ivanka Trump tweeted about it. But what actually is quantum supremacy? Understanding quantum mechanics is notoriously difficult. It is counterintuitive and the math that is used to describe it seems pretty tough. But nowadays we have computers and we are simulating everything. From the weather to the stock market, computers are used everywhere to simulate complex systems. So why not for quantum systems? The reason is quantum superposition. Imagine the spin of an electron. In quantum physics, the spin can be either up or down. Let's call it 0 or 1. When it is measured, it will point in one of the two directions with a certain probability. So to simulate the electron with a classical computer, we need to work with two numbers. The probability for the spin being up and down. That seems pretty easy. So what's the problem? Well, if we now have two spins, there are now four different possibilities to measure them in. So we need to store four numbers on our classical computer. For three spins, it's eight numbers. For four, it's 16. It scales exponentially as 2 to the power of the number of spins. Just adding one spin makes the simulation two times as difficult. For just 50 spins, the number is, well, let's just say very big. So there's absolutely no way we can really understand what is happening in a bigger quantum system, for example a molecule with thousands of electrons, if we use a classical computer. In 1982, Richard Feynman came up with a very simple trick to circumvent this problem. Just use a quantum system that you can control to simulate another quantum system that you're interested in. The idea of a quantum computer was born. Since Feynman's original idea, it's become clear that quantum computers can be used to speed up calculations for many more tasks than just simulating quantum systems from factoring prime numbers to searching a database to solving optimization problems and machine learning. Quantum computing holds many theoretical promises which have yet to be realized in practice. The first step in this journey is for quantum computers to perform any task, no matter what it is, that cannot be done on a classical computer in any reasonable time. This is what researchers call quantum supremacy. So what did Google do? Well, Google first built a superconducting quantum computer with 53 qubits. The qubits act like the electrons from the example before, quantum systems that can be in a superposition of two states. Google used a type of superconducting charge qubit. The quantum supremacy experiment that Google performed is actually rather simple. They started off with all qubits in the zero state. After that, they applied random gates, so operations, that changed the state of the qubits. After that, they pairwise entangled the qubits. This procedure was repeated multiple times. This creates a very complicated wave function that cannot be simulated efficiently classically. After that, they simply measured the state of every qubit. Every measurement gives a different bit string. Repeating those measurements gives a distribution of bit string which reveals the probabilities for the different outcomes. Google sampled from the quantum computer 3 million times, which took them just 600 seconds. So basically generating a distribution of a lot of random numbers in a very complicated way. According to Google, generating the exact same distribution of bit strings on a classical state-of-the-art supercomputer would take approximately 10,000 years. Now, just a few weeks after Google presented their achievement to the public, IBM released a paper claiming that the task would actually just take two and a half days on the Summit supercomputer, though without actually running the simulation. So who is right? Did Google achieve quantum supremacy or not? Well, IBM's arguments are sound. The team found a way to trade increased memory usage for faster computation time, which might be enough to squeeze the simulation on the Summit supercomputer by exploiting the vast memory resources of that machine. According to IBM, simulating the 53 qubits would take 64 pebibytes of disk storage. One pebibyte is 2 to the 50 bytes. To put this into perspective, 
Just one pebby byte can store more than a trillion pages of plain text, or 239,553 DVD movies, or enough 4 minute songs to continuously play them for 2,250 years. So yeah, a lot. The 64 pebby bytes of storage for the 53 qubits put it below the 250 pebby bytes capacity of Summit, though just adding 2 more qubits, so 55 qubits in total, already requires 256 pebby bytes, which is above Summit's storage capacities. So the simulation would theoretically take a reasonable amount of time to complete, but if no current supercomputer has the storage capacity to actually do the simulation, what's the point? Alright guys, thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this insight into one of the recent dramas in quantum computing. Let me know in the comments which side you're on, Google or IBM. And please don't forget to give the video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more quantum computing content.